I'll, I'll start recording as well, just because I knew some people um, can't be here who've asked the questions. Okay. Sounds good. So just let me know when you're when you're ready. Um, should be good to go. So feel free to start whenever. Okay. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka Nabila Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, Before we begin with the uh, questions I just wanted to um, thank the MSA for putting this together The council specifically For putting this together and giving us an opportunity to, to connect An opportunity to have some important questions that we have on our minds answered. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them for this effort and all the efforts that they do to provide an Islamic environment for the students at UVA. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them and to bless their endeavors. I also want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you and to bless you for coming and for your religious commitment and for your concern for your spiritual well-being because that's what has brought you here so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take that seed and to nurture it and to make it grow into a very strong deeply rooted tree of iman in your hearts and that he multiplies uh, and makes your reward immense for making the time to attend uh, this session uh, that said um I think a total of six questions came in uh, gradually. I want to or answer them in the order that they were received. So if you submitted a question and that question does not get answered this evening, because I think we've allotted roughly 30 minutes for the session, then inshallah when we meet again, know that your questions will be the first ones to be answered uh, next time, inshallah ta'ala. So that said, uh, the first question, um, the questioner writes, what is the halal way to look for a potential spouse in college? And before um, answering the question, I wanted to mention uh, first and foremost that I love everything about this question. I love everything about this question. Um, for example, I love that the person, this young person, young adult person who is uh, currently studying in university is interested in marriage interested in marriage at a time when most people um, the last thing that they're interested in is mainly, uh, young people at the age of uh, university typically when you ask them about marriage that's the last thing that they want to think about particularly because of a lot of the responsibility that will come and be part and parcel of being married and I want to expand on this before continuing uh, and say that um, a lot of this disinterest in marriage that we find uh, from some of our, um, our young adult Muslims is a disinterest that spawns from the influence of Western culture on many young Muslims. Um, we can't deny that living in this environment, it affects us. People are products of their environment. And so consequently, uh, we live in an environment where people around us are not interested in, in something or they're interested in something and we become consequently interested in those things or disinterested in those things accordingly. Uh, the second thing I want to mention as it relates to this is that um, this disinterest in marriage is often not accompanied by a disinterest in the opposite sex or disinterest in sex and this which is the third point this cocktail this interest in the opposite sex accompanied by disinterest in marriage is a very dangerous cocktail it's a very dangerous potentially dangerous mixture and when we look at our non-muslim colleagues we see that uh, this cocktail what it has led them to what what problems it has caused for them as individuals what problems this caused for them as a society. And so it is for this reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger have encouraged young people, encouraged um, Muslim people of all ages, but particularly young people has encouraged them to get married. If they have um, the 
uh, appetite for marriage and if they have uh, suitable circumstances for marriage has encouraged them to get married. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah uh, An-Nur, He says, وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ إِيَّكُونُوا فُقَرَى يُغْنِيهِمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, And marry the unmarried among you. Get them married off. And the righteous among your male and female bondservants. If they happen to be poor, do not let that prevent you. Allah will enrich them from His bounty. Allah's bounty is limitless and He is all-knowing. And this is important because one of the things that when you suggest, uh, particularly to young people, that they should get married, one of the things that will lead them to push back and say no is financial concerns. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Is quieting those concerns by saying, If they be poor, if they be financially um, at a financial disadvantage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will enrich them from his, from his bounty. We also have the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ was addressing a gathering of young people. Particularly, as we said earlier, Allah wants all Muslims to be married. But here, the Prophet ﷺ particularly is addressing a group of young people. He says, Ya, ma, ya ma'ashir al-shabab. He says, O oh, assembly of young people. Whoever amongst you is able to get married, financially able to get married, in a, in a position to get married, uh, then let him get married. He said, why? He says, because it will aid him in lowering his gaze and guarding his chastity, his or her chastity. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِيعْ فَعَلَيْهِ بِسَّوْمٍ And whoever is unable to get married, then let him fast. فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَعْ Because it will blunt the sharpness of his desire. Now let's contemplate briefly uh, this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He starts and he says, يَا مَعْشِرِ shabab. He says, O assembly of young people. So he's addressing what? Young people. He's addressing people like you. He's addressing people like you and encouraging those people to what? encouraging those people to get married okay so when we talk about marriage in Islam we shouldn't think as young people um, well maybe I shouldn't say we because I'm old right but you shouldn't think as old pe as young people that that this is not re referring to you I'm not being referenced here I'm not being addressed here no the prophet is saying yeah Masha Shabbat why because it is the desire for the opposite sex is there Okay, and it's particularly strong in young people. Like, then he goes on and he says, Man Let him get married. He commands it. Commands it like he's encouraging. Say, get that thing done. If you're able to do it, if you're in a position to do it, get that thing done. Do it. Right? And then he explains why. He says, Because it will help him to lower his gaze, not to look at things that he shouldn't look at. And that doesn't just mean when you go out to the store or when you go out to, um, for a jog. It also means on our phones and on our laptops. And because our access and on television and on cable TV, our access to things that we shouldn't look at that are desirous to us is much greater than it was during the time of the Prophet. That's when he said this hadith. That it's not just if I go out of my home, I might come across something. No, it's everywhere. And so one of the things that will help us not to look at those things that we shouldn't look at is getting married to Ahsan al Farj. And what will also help us to protect what? Protect our chastity. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, He wants to He wants to protect us from our own selves and from our own weaknesses and from our own desires. And then he concludes and he says, Faman lam So he who is not able to get married, as if he's saying the only one who shouldn't get married is the one who is incapable of doing so. As if to say, everybody should be doing this unless they're totally incapable of doing so. Another thing I love about the question, I'm still on why I love the question, I haven't got to the answer yet, but I think these and I'm coming, I promise you, I'm coming. So another thing I love about the question is the fact that it shows that the questioner is an independent thinker. 
and he refuses to allow to allow his or herself or his or her personal decisions to be dictated by groupthink, right? I refuse to just go with the herd, right? Doing what's best for the group that you may or may not belong to instead of doing what's best for you in this world and hereafter as a practitioner of Islam. This is very important. As Muslims, we are encouraged by our religion. In fact, our religion demands that we have our own distinctively unique Muslim identities and Muslim what? And Muslim minds that we think for ourselves and we think in light of what? Of our beliefs and our values, etc. So for example, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the Prophet at a time when the Prophet was, was particularly in a vulnerable state, he and the Muslims, he told the Prophet to be very firm about what he believed in and to tell the non-Muslims that he, to take a stand and to stand up for what he believed in at a time where he was particularly vulnerable. He told the Prophet, he revealed to the Prophet the, the, the verse in, or the, uh, the chapter in which he told the Prophet, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, O oh, you disbelievers, لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I don't worship what you worship. And you don't worship what I worship. And in the end, you have your religion and I have mine. We're not the same. And I'm not going to be a carbon copy of you and just put and stamp Muslim on it. Look like you, talk like you, walk like you, think like you, and then stamp Muslim on it. No, I have my own unique Muslim identity. And so therefore, I am going to think differently. And sometimes there are going to be things that we do alike, just naturally. But there's also going to be points where we have a fork in the road. And you go one way and I go the other way. And so I like the fact that this person is not practicing this group think. Not falling for it. I don't have to think like they think. If they're disinterested in marriage, or they want to find alternative ways to satisfy or gratify their needs, let them do that. But that's not for me, because I'm a Muslim. So I'm very, very, uh, I was very impressed with that. And then last but not least, the fact that the that the that the, uh, the brother or sister who sent the question said a halal way. How do I get married in college in a halal way? They care about doing it the right way, the way that will please Allah, earn them Allah's pleasure, and prevent them from displeasing Allah or earning them Allah's anger. Very very impressed. Whoever wrote the question, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you and facilitate for you uh, marriage and make it come uh, swiftly and easily for you. Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. So with that said, uh, I would like to offer uh, the following advices uh, for any young person interested uh, in getting married. Um, the first thing I would suggest to the person is to learn about yourself. I have to offer what are my needs as an individual, that I would need that spouse, that potential spouse, to fulfill. Uh, the second thing I would suggest is to learn a little, a little something about marriage. Learn about marriage in Islam. What does it mean to be married in Islam? And these two things, learning about yourself and learning about marriage in Islam, will help you determine, one, if you're really ready. Are you really ready? And two, what to look for in a spouse. If you answer these two questions, learn about yourself, Learn about the dean. I'm sorry, learn about what the dean says about marriage. That will help you determine if you're ready. Am I really ready for this? And then two, what should I be looking for in a spouse? Okay? Someone who will be the yin to my yang, etc. Right? Um, I would encourage uh, the person to make regular dua, make regular supplications to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah for two things. For their help, his help, subhanahu wa ta'ala and his blessing. Because if Allah helps you in anything, it'll be successful. And if he puts his blessing in it, then you won't be disappointed. So I would make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his help and for his blessings. Um, there's some specific things that you should do. And most of what I'm going to say is applicable to both uh, young ladies and young men. Uh, the first one is, obviously, you're going to have to identify someone, right? You're going to have to identify someone that you are interested in or uh, potentially uh, targeting for uh, marriage. Uh, the second thing I would recommend is to inquire discreetly. Inquire discreetly about that person from people who, 
who know them to find out if they're a suitable match. We said earlier that you need to find out um, who you are and what you need. What you And that will help you determine and what does Islam say about marriage? It'll help you determine what? What you should be looking for. So now you're at the point where you need to identify is this person really what I'm looking for? Do they check the boxes or check most of the boxes, etc.? Uh, then after that, once you've identified someone and you've determined that yes, they are um, a good candidate, then at that point I would suggest um, that you inform uh, your parents and you also inform the other persons or other, other parties' parents. And this is important, why? Because in Islam, we don't have uh, anything called uh, eloping. We don't have anything where, you know, two people fall in love, love at first sight, and then they go to Vegas, and they come back, and they tell everybody, I'm married. You know, we just don't have that in Islam, right? We don't have, an, we don't have a marriage that doesn't involve the parents or the guardians of the young man and the young woman. We don't have that. And so, if it, let's say, for example, it was a young man, and he identified someone, he inquired discreetly, and he was confident that this person was a good match for him, then he would tell his parents, because his parents can then what? They can be of assistance. They can assist him uh, in making this happen and facilitating it and guiding him, etc. And he also needs to tell the girl's parents to get what? To get their permission, to get their, their blessing. Because what good would it do for him to do all of this work uh, and work on trying to uh, make this happen if he didn't have the blessing of the girl's parents, considering the fact that we don't elope, we don't have marriage without the blessing and the permission and the assistance and the cooperation of parents. We don't have that, or guardians. Uh, um, once you get to the point where you have the parents uh, involved and you have their assistance and you have their blessing, then now we need to find those lawful ways to get to know that person and confirm compatibility. Get to know the person and confirm compatibility, right? And um, it's you have to be creative. It's not as, as, as easy as it may sound, but it is, it is doable. For example, um, let's say that a young man and a young woman uh, have reached that stage where the parents are involved, the parents are permitting it, they're giving their blessings, and they just want to make sure that they're compatible. Well, they can, they can meet, they can spend time together as long as there is a chaperone, as long as there's someone to make sure that nothing impermissible is done, nothing impermissible is said. And so they can go for walks in the park with a chaperone a few feet away, all right? And they can, you know, talk and spend time. They can go to a cafe, they can go to a restaurant. And those meetings would be chaperoned. He can go to uh, her home with her parents and sit and have you know dinner or lunch and vice versa and so these are all things that can be done uh, the main thing that we need to uh, you know keep in mind is that um, in Islam uh, we don't have what typically is called in the American context dating uh, we do not have that and we don't have um, uh, the permissibility to be alone with that other person who we are interested in uh, the Prophet ﷺ was very adamant about uh, one man and one woman being alone uh, together. And so these are the, th the main things that we need to avoid. But as long as we avoid the things uh, that are clearly impermissible and our intentions are pure and we have the parents involved and we have their permission, their blessing, and their uh, assistance, then inshallah um, um, the way that we approach it in order to get to know each other, inshallah ta'ala, should be uh, salim, it should be acceptable. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it fruitful uh, and blessed. And so this is what I, um, I have to say about uh, that first question. Uh, I don't know if the person is present and they felt that the answer was satisfactory. If not, if they wanted some additional information, we can provide that. Um, they can feel free to... Um, to let us know in the chat, I guess, and then we can go from there. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll go to the second question, uh, which reads, uh, to what extent am I allowed to talk about good deeds and bad deeds? Can I tell my friends the ways I'm making myself a better Muslim or give them advice based upon the mistakes I've made in the past? How do I answer incriminating questions? Is it better to lie than say, 
I've done X or Y. طيب. Uh, so this is another very, very good question. Uh, I'll begin or preface my answer by saying that purity of intention is the bedrock of worship in Islam. Purity of intention meaning that um, we do what we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't do it uh, to impress, to please, to um, receive praise from others or to be ostentatious towards others, etc. Let me see. I didn't, I didn't quite see that. Uh, it flashed. Let me just check real quick on the chat because somebody said. Uh, this is a very good follow-up, um, and it says, for the first question, it says, what if the parents do not approve of their child getting married at the time that the person wants to? And that was actually something that I thought about um, addressing, because that is a, a very um, valid question and a very strong possibility. Um, and it's, it's, it's a problem because it's not just the young people who are affected and influenced by... Um, by society, parents are too. And parents are actually telling their children, you know, don't get married, you know, wait, you know, you're not ready, etc. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the parents are going to be, uh, for lack of a better word, don't want to be disrespectful in any way, they're going to be a stumbling block in some cases. And what I would recommend is to look at, if I were that young person and my parents were telling me, um, you know, I don't approve I don't think you should do it now, etc. I would try to figure out, try to find out, try to get them to be very um, candid about um, what exactly it is that makes them feel I am not ready. Uh, is it that um, you haven't finished your studies? Then you have to, you know, resolve that issue with them and answer that issue or provide them assurances, for example, that you'll complete. They may say that you are um, too young, you're too immature. So then you're going to have to convince them that you are uh, mature enough. Uh, and then if uh, if it comes to an, if it's still at an impasse, uh, then I would suggest that you consult with a, uh, a religious authority or figure uh, who your parents respect and who can convince your parents that they shouldn't stop you. Really, Islamically, legally, unless they have an Islamic reason to prevent you from doing it and going through with it, uh, then they shouldn't do that, especially if your heart is set on it because of the uh, potential uh, consequences that could come. Uh, if your heart is set on something that's lawful and they deny you. And so I would definitely seek uh, the support. Hopefully you won't have to get to that. You can just have um, very um, productive discussions with your parents and you can argue, you can argue cogently that this is the right thing for you uh, at this time, etc. Um, but if that isn't the case, I would recommend that you seek uh, the assistance and consultation uh, and um, arbitration from a disinterested third party religious figure who can convince your parents that um, you are ready and this is a good thing. And if you really have your mind set on it and you're going about it in a lawful way, uh, then um, then they shouldn't prevent you. Then there's another follow-up, the child not being financially independent, the reason that parents are hesitant. Now, that's a valid reason, though. We said, I said, if the parents don't have a valid Islamic reason, if the child is not financially uh, stable enough to uh, support a household, for example, if it was a, if it was a young man, uh, then, yeah, that will be a valid that will be a valid reason, and then that young man would have to then, what, resolve that issue. Uh, so basically, I'm not financially stable. Okay, then let me make myself financially stable. Let me remove that stumbling block because that is a valid objection. If that's the only objection, then all that, then the burden then becomes, the onus then becomes on the young person to go ahead and resolve that issue. We're talking about when the parents don't have a valid uh, Islamic re reason to object. If they have a valid reason to object, we need to resolve that, uh, that reason, resolve that issue. Looks like we're going to spend, uh, Thaqib, we're going to spend, uh, they don't want to go to question, but that's fine. I mean, these are very good questions, very good follow-up questions. And we should finish this one before we go on to another, so that's fine. Uh, so there's another follow-up that says, what are some good, important questions to ask a potential spouse if 
you've reached the stage of getting to know one another? Oh, this is an excellent question. Um, well, first of all, look at yourself and look at your, your needs and turn those needs into questions. That's one thing. Um, also, if you're a young lady, um, there is a lot of responsibility, particularly financial responsibility, um, that is, um, that rests on the shoulders of the young man. And so you want to make sure that he is uh, financially able to support you, uh, to provide you with a place to stay, uh, to take care of um, the bills associated with the household, to provide food, to provide for your, you know, basically all of the necessities, you know, clothing, etc. Uh, and also um, you talk about, you have real discussions about um, what, financial responsibilities will be like, um, what, if anything, uh, he'll be expecting you to do, and whether or not you feel comfortable with that. Obviously, the USL, the original, the basic rule of thumb is that you shouldn't have any financial responsibilities. Um, you are his queen, and he should take care of you accordingly. Uh, but if there are any, if there's anything in his mind that you will have to be responsible for, then that should come out beforehand so it's not a bait and switch type of situation where you were under the impression it was going to be one way and it's a different way. Uh, I think it's also important to ask about his family, about his upbringing, about um, the dynamic uh, in uh, the household in which you grew up. Why? Because people are products of their environment and as they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, and so you want to make sure that he comes from a stable household um, so that um, that uh, stability uh, will carry over uh, into the household that you will build uh, with him. Um, and anything else, again, again, as I said, it's kind of hard to give you an exhaustive list, encyclopedic list of questions, but these are some general ones I think that are very important, particularly for young ladies. Uh, but as I said, when we, when, we said, when we talked about, when we talked at the outset, we said that you should look at yourself, learn about yourself, who am I? Uh, what do I have to offer? And also, what are my needs? That last part, your needs, you have to turn that into questions for your spouse and make sure they're going to meet those needs. Um, and also, if you do get to that point uh, and you're struggling with specific questions, uh, then again, I would seek the um, I would seek the advice of a learned religious person, and they can help you. Uh, formulate questions, specific questions. Right now, I'm kind of, you know, basically grabbing questions out of the air. But if the religious figure knows something about you, then they would be able to help you to formulate questions which are specific to your needs and make sure that you get the answers and get the information that helps you to know if, in fact, this is a situation that you should you should pursue. Uh, any other follow-ups? Don't be shy, Yeshabab. This is a very important question. And we're happy to entertain it. So any other follow-up questions for this question before we go on to the next one? Not sure how much time, how much time is left. Let me see. Let me see. All right. We've a little, we're a little over time, but I think we can do the, the second question. Uh, and then we can stop after that. Are you okay with that, Thapib, or are you guys in a hurry? That should be fine. Just as, as long as you feel comfortable and if you have anywhere to go, feel free to end it whenever. Okay, I don't see any more follow-ups for the first one. So I'll go ahead and do the second one, and then we'll close with the second one. The third one, which I'm planning to answer tonight, we'll save it for uh, the first one out of the gate next time, inshallah. So I'll repeat the question, uh, to what extent am I allowed to talk about good deeds and bad deeds? Can I tell my friends the ways I'm making myself a better Muslim or give them advice based upon the mistakes I've made in the past? How do I answer incriminating questions? Is it better to lie than say I've done X or Y? And so there's a few things in the question. The first thing I wanted to say right out of the gate is that uh, purity of intention is the bedrock of Islamic faith, bedrock of Islamic worship. The main thing that we're supposed to be concerned about when it comes to um, being Muslim and practicing Islam is that we are sincere and our intention is pure and there's no, there's no corruption or impurity of intention, intention in terms of our motivation for doing the things that we do, 
and um, and to whom we are uh, offering the acts of worship and whose praise and whose pleasure we are seeking from the actions that we do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, in the Quran, He says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاءَ وَيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ He says, and they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to Him in worship, meaning pure, purely doing everything they do for His sake. We also have the hadith, the Qudsi hadith, where the Prophet said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَاءِ يَنِ الشِّرْكِ فَمَنْ عَمِلَ he said, I am the most independent of anyone and the least in need of an associate, a partner, a rival, someone to what? To be associated with me. So whoever does a deed and associates a rival with me in that act, I will abandon him and his association. And one of the things obviously that undermines the purity of intention and corrupts our intention is arriya, which is doing things to be seen, or a sum'ah, which is basically telling people about our deeds in order to elicit praise from them, right? These two things corrupt the purity of intention. As the Prophet said, he also, in, uh, and we also know that these two things, arriya, doing things to be seen, a sum'ah, doing, basically telling people what you've done in order to elicit praise, these two things are a type of shirk. They are a type of shirk, a type of uh, minor idolatry. As the Prophet said in the hadith, he said, أَخْوَفُ مَا خَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ الشِّرْكُ الْأَصْغَرُ He said, the thing I fear for you the most is the minor shirk. They asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the minor shirk? He said, arriya. He said, showing off or ostentation. So I want to say uh, in the beginning of answering the question that uh, we have to be extremely careful when it comes to our deeds, which are public deeds, it means deeds that you can't conceal, deeds that people can see, right? Deeds that we, we can't hide. Those deeds, we have to be particularly careful in, when revealing them to others with the intention of ostentation or showing off. If that is even a remote possibility, then we have to avoid it. If there's even a remote possibility that what we are doing, we're doing it because we want to be seen or we're saying it because we want to be heard and to elicit praise, if that's even remotely possible, if there's any remote possibility that could be part of the motivation behind us doing something or telling people something we've done, then we should completely avoid it. Why? Because if, as we said in the early hadith, the Qudsi hadith, if we do a deed with the intention of pleasing Allah and pleasing the people at the same time, Allah will what? will not accept our deed. He'll leave us to the people, okay? However, if a person can be certain, underscore the word certain, that the intention for sharing their good deeds or doing them openly, they're certain that it's not ostentation, but rather to encourage others to do as he or she has done. The whole reason I'm saying this is to encourage other people. Not to get their praise, not to let them see what I'm doing, but just as a means of encouraging them. If a person can be certain of this, then there's no harm in doing that. And one of the evidences for this is the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In tubudu sadaqati fa ni'immahi, wa in tukhfuha wa tu'tuha al-fuqara fa huwa khayrun lakum. He says, if you disclose your charitable offerings, if you do them publicly, then that is fine and good. And it's even, some scholars say, in some instances, it's encouraged to do that because why? That encourages other people. And some of you have attended fundraisers and seen that someone, that the, 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 the fundraiser is just, you know, you know, pouring his heart out. Come on, give, give. And no one, no one gives. Finally, somebody says, okay, I'll give 10,000. I'll give 5,000. And all of a sudden, people start giving one after the other. That one person encouraged other people to give. So some scholars say that in, in some instances, well, it's, it's good to do this, right? As Allah says, But if you conceal it and give it to those who need secretly, then that is what? That is better. So both are acceptable depending on what? 
on the intention. So if your intention by telling your friends, um, for example, by telling them, uh, I fasted, you know, yesterday and it felt so good and it was so easy. I thought it was going to be hard because the days are so long and you're telling them this so that they will what they'll, they'll be, they'll fast. They'll be encouraged to fast. They'll be motivated to fast. And they'll, maybe they had, they were thinking, man, the days are so long and it's so hot. I don't know if I can get through it. You can get through it because you're stronger than me. You're stronger than me and you're more fit than me and you're, and you're more accustomed to fasting than me. You can do it. Right? So if that's the person's intention, there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to be careful because if that the slightest amount of corruption gets into the intention, it will ruin what? It will ruin uh, the deed. Um, then the person they asked about giving advice. And is it okay if I give, you know, my, my friends, my colleagues, my associates, how I give them advice? And we have to understand that giving advice is not showing off. We cannot associate or we cannot... Um, uh, we cannot consider the two synonymous, right? That basically giving advice and showing off are one and the same. They are not, right? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, in one hadith, he said that showing off is a type of shirk, a type of major sin. But in the, in the other hadith, he called giving advice, not only did he say it was from the deen, he called it the deen, the, the religion. It is the religion. He said in the hadith of Tamim al-Dari, ad-deen al-Siha. He said religion is being sincere and advising sincerely. Meaning, it's part and parcel of being a Muslim. To give what? To give advice. He also commanded the Muslims, each and every Muslim, that if they see something wrong, they're supposed to command the good and forbid the evil. If they can command the good and forbid the evil physically with their hands, like physically change it. Like for example, let's say I have a friend and they, me, that friend and I are extremely close. And that friend, one day we're out and about, he takes out a cigarette and puts it in his mouth. I'm close enough to him that I can what? I can snatch that cigarette out of his mouth and break it in half and say, what are you doing? If I can do that, our religion encourages us to do that. And if I can do that because we don't have that type of relationship, then I'm allowed then to what? To I'm encouraged then to what? To advise him instead. The Prophet said in the hadith of Bisa'id al-Khudri, he said, he said, Man ra munkaran, biyadi. Whoever amongst you sees some wrong being done in front of him. Then let him stop the wrong from being committed. Let him put a stop to it with his hands, physically. If he can't do that, then let him what? Give advice. Tell the people, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. And this is important to mention because a lot of people, when you give them advice, they'll push back and say, you're judging me. You're being judgmental. And that's totally not true. That's totally incorrect. And that's something that we're taking from other faiths. Other faiths, they basically have adopted the, um, they've adopted the philosophy that everybody should just mind their own business. Everybody should do whatever they want to do. And people who observe people doing something that they don't agree with or they think is wrong according to scripture, they should just mind their own business and let people do whatever they want to do and not say anything. That is not an Islamic principle. Islam says, I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. If I can stop them from doing wrong physically, I should do it. If I can't do it physically because I don't have the authority and we don't have that type of relationship, I should stop them by what? Giving them advice. I should tell them, hey, you shouldn't do that. I should remind them because a reminder benefits the believers. And this is no different than if I and my friend get into the car and we're going to go uh, to a coffee shop down the road. And he doesn't put a seatbelt on. I say to him, I say, hey man, buckle up. Seatbelts save lives. Right? By Allah's permission. He doesn't say, why are you judging me? Nobody says that. Right? If he tries to smoke a cigarette, and I say, you know, come on, smoking kills, man. Smoking is, is, is one of the leading um, causes of cancer. Don't do that. He doesn't say, you're judging me. Nobody says that. If I say to my friend, hey man, put a mask on. Masks prevent the spread of COVID-19. You don't want this. is a nasty disease. You don't want this. Nobody says you're judging me. You're just what? Advising me. Why when it comes to deen, if somebody tells you, hey, we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to dress like that. We're not supposed to talk like that. We say, oh, you're judging me. It's not judging. It's just giving advice. And the two are not synonymous. They are not one and the same. Uh, Thumba Adalik, the questioner, he asked, he said, what if I'm asked incriminating questions? What if somebody asks me an incriminating question, meaning they ask you about a sin? They ask you, hey, have you ever done X? 
Come on, you know you've done why. I've seen you do why, right? They start, or I, or I think you look like the kind of person who would do, you know, this thing or whatever. So they're putting him in a corner and trying to make him confess uh, to a sin. And no one should feel compelled to reveal a sin that Allah has concealed. Something that they've done, okay, uh, because we're all human, we all make mistakes, and that's another thing, too, that's very important, that... You are human. You make mistakes. It's part of your nature to make mistakes. Allah knows it's part of your nature to make mistakes. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. And so it, it, it's going to happen. As much as we don't want it to happen, it's going to happen. The Prophet said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every human being is a habitual sinner. It won't happen once or twice. You know, that's how we are. But that's, that's not the problem. The fact that we sin, the problem is what, what we do after we sin. As the Prophet said in the hadith, And the best of those who sin are those who what? They repent and they make amends. They try to make things right after they made them wrong. And that's what matters. So the first thing is that part, part of the thing that makes us feel compelled to confess is because we feel guilt from sinning. That guilt from sinning should not make you feel compelled to confess. It's not wrong to conceal your sins. In fact, it's wajib. It's required for you to conceal your sins. The Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, "Kullu ummati mu'afa illa al-mujahideen." He said, "All of my ummah, everybody in my nation, my community, my religious community is going to be forgiven." You guys are sinners. Allah knows it. He's going to forgive you. Illa al-mujahideen, except those who sin publicly. He was asked, "Who are the public sinners, O Messenger of Allah?" What does that mean to sin publicly? He said, in the middle mujahara, he said, from public sinning is when a person does something and Allah conceals it. Allah covers it. Nobody knows about it except him and Allah. And then he wakes up the next morning after Allah has covered his sin. He says, ya fulan. He says, oh, so-and-so. Inni fa'altu kedha wa kedha al-bariha. He says, oh, so-and-so, I did such and such last night. After Allah concealed his sin, he goes and what? He goes and tells people. So what is the Prophet telling us? He's telling us if Allah covers your sin, you keep it what? You keep it covered. He also told us that man satra al nasi satrallahu alayhi. Whoever covers the faults of other people, Allah will cover his faults. And we all have faults. So nobody should be asking anyone about what? About their faults. Because if you put them in a corner and force them to reveal, your faults may also be what? May also be revealed. Okay? And so with that said, I would say two things to that person who feels kind of compelled, pushed into a corner to reveal his sins because his friends are saying, hey, I know you've done this. Come on, tell me, man. Right? The way you respond is one, you tell that person to fear Allah. And not to concern themselves with that which is not concerned them. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, Bin husni Islam al la yani. It is from the good qualities of a person's Islam, a sign of a person's being a good Muslim, that they don't concern themselves with that which does not concern you. What good does it do for A to know the sin that was committed by B? What, do, what good does it do? Because when A meets Allah, Allah is not going to ask about the sins of B. He's going to ask about his own sins. So busy yourself with your own sins. Tell him that. Fear, don't fear Allah and busy yourself with your own sins. Number two is never feel compelled to reveal your sins and never reveal your sins. Keep your sins a secret. We don't have confessionals. We don't confess. We don't confess, we don't go to someone and say, hey, you know, oh, hey, oh, my father, I have sinned, and this is what I did, and this is when I did it, and this is who I did it with. We don't do that. The only time you would do that is if you need to be, to be informed of how to resolve a problem. You need to give the person certain information so they can give you a ruling, a verdict, so that you can act accordingly to what? To make things right. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, خير الخطائين التوابون. The best of those who sin are those who repent. I need to know how can I repent from this particular sin, so I need to kind of reveal it to someone. But even then, you're only revealing, revealing it to them because you need to, right? And obviously this person who's asking you, they don't need to know. They want to know, okay? And so with that, uh, inshallah ta'ala, we'll bring uh, today's session to a close. Uh, maybe we'll have to make an hour long, Thaqib. Maybe we'll have to go for an hour. I think next time, if you guys have the time, it looks like everybody pretty much stayed. So next time, we'll, we'll just set it for an hour. We'll set it for an hour. Ahmed was being stingy, and he only wanted to do 30 minutes. But I twisted his arm. See? I, I, don't, I don't care. 
I, don't, I twisted his arm. I made it 50 minutes in spite of him. And that's what you get, Ahmed. That's what you get for only making it 30 minutes. All right? All right, then. So you guys be good. Barakallahu feekum. The discussion, I, I, I thought it was a very beneficial and uh, productive um, lecture. So thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. Thank you all for showing up uh, and making time. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll see you guys, uh, I think, next Thursday we have Sira. And then we'll be back the next Tuesday for the questions, inshallah ta'ala. Until then, you guys be blessed. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Wa nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. As-salamu alaykum ya akhwan.